Hello, everyone. We're going to start chapter 16, which is about evolution. I would have to say this is my favorite chapter of all of biology. I'm a big um, just nerd when it comes to evolution and talking about evolution. So let's just get right into it. This is the next chapter, chapter 16. I love this art here in the beginning. All right, so I usually play a video called Where Do We Come From? It's from Bill Nye. I'll try to post it on the first day that we go over this stuff, but um, it's a really good uh, kind of just intro to evolution. So where did all this uh, evolution come from? Um, remember, this is a black slide, so we do not have to write it. Um, but time, we have mass amounts of time occurring bef uh, between the beginning of the universe and even the beginning of our Earth till now. It's on the, on the scale of billions of years. As you can see, a timeline here, we're going to do a timeline activity in class. But uh, this is basically where all that uh, this evolution come there comes from is, um, is time. It's mass amounts of deep time. So our universe is about 13.8 billion years old. Our Earth is about 4.5 billion years old. Life on Earth itself is about 3.8. So there was a time period on Earth when it was too hot, just life what, what couldn't um, have evolved, so it wasn't around until about 3.8 billion years ago. And then the first pro prokaryotic life uh, is about 2 billion years old. So again, it takes a while for all of this evolution to, to evolve. You can see this is like a timeline here. Um, it takes billions of years for multicellular eukaryotic life to evolve. And then after that point, um, it really starts taking off. And that's where we get all the um, variety that we see today. Evolution doesn't describe how life began. Um, evolution describes how life has changed since that point. So again, life is about 3.8 billion years old. It, 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 it evolved somehow. It started some point around that time. Um, it's very simple, but evolution doesn't talk about how it uh, it came to be. It just talks about how life has evolved since that point. Uh, evolution has some data on how the first life began, but uh, we really don't go over it in this class. That's for an AP class, um, but we're still trying to figure that that out. And uh, that's just one of the areas of science that I love to say that you can research later on in life is we're still trying to figure out these things about how life first began. All right, here's another video we won't watch. It's about the geological timeline, but that's all of 15.1. Yeah, 15.1 is very short. I just go over a, a lot of activities in class about deep time and making sure you understand how old this earth is. All right, so pre-Darwin, before Darwin, we know Charles Darwin's the father of evolution. Before Darwin came around, um, the idea that was generally accepted was that species are fixed. And this is this means the species don't change, they're perfect, they were produced for perfectly, and they are ever perfect. Um, they actually didn't believe in extinction. They thought the extinction wasn't a thing because if something is perfect, it can't go away. Um, and that no new species are created, and that the Earth is a couple thousand years old. Obviously, now today we know that, that all of those are untrue and that species change. We have uh, new species that are... Uh, that evolve through through natural process, and the Earth is obviously billions of years old. All right, so there's evidence that supports this. That, uh, again, there's there's a lot of geological evidence that was just coming about uh, during this time period, right before Darwin as well, uh, by Charles Ly Charles Lyell and James Hutton. Um, Lyell actually wrote a book uh, that Darwin read about his understanding of deep time and the, the age of the Earth and age of the universe. So it's on the scale of billions and millions and millions of years, not a couple thousand years. So uh, before Darwin, um, there was a man named Jean-Baptiste de Lamarck, and he was a French naturalist. He understood that, the, again, the Earth was millions of years old, and he proposed that organisms pass on acquired characteristics. Um, this is incorrect. What I'm talking about with acquired is, let's say you have, like, a, you know, you get a scar on your arm. Then your kids might have that scar on their arm. So you're passing on these things you acquire throughout your lifetime. Pro, and he also proposed that organisms could produce new traits based on needs. So, like, if you need a... You know, let's say a third arm to do some, you know, task that you would produce that uh, eventually. And that's, again, incorrect. He was he was correct on a couple different things. Um, and it's interesting that, you know, just what he thought. He was very close to the theory of evolution, but he really just kind of missed it just by a little bit. This is, again, I like to talk about giraffes in this. You can see Lamarck's giraffes. It says that, uh, you know, as the the trees get taller and taller, so will the giraffe's neck because they stretch them out. You, it's called a use and disuse where the giraffes are going to keep on using this, this long neck, so they're going to have this adaptation to have these really long necks, and it's just not how things work. <laughs> I was like showing this image, chainsaw, chainsaw, chainsaw. This beaver would really be good if it had a chainsaw. Yeah, it's just not how evolution works. 
All right. So Charles Darwin, um, born in 1809, early interest in natural history. He was very interested in the, just being outside and just collecting plants, bugs, whatever. Um, he went to medical school, liked the natural history classes, but he dropped out. Um, father then sent him to ministry school and uh, he liked the science classes still, but then again, he dropped out again. So I like to remind students, even though if you drop out of two things like, like Darwin did, you can still be known in every biology textbook ever. All right. So um, at that time, he was uh, about, it was like 1830s. He was 22 years old. He was invited to travel the world on a boat called the HMS Beagle. This voyage uh, or this boat was mapping the South American coastline um, because they were trying to map to get better maps for, the, for the England. And uh, he was a companion to Captain Fitzroy. Um, you can see Captain Fitzroy, I think, right here. Yep. And uh, he was just a companion. He wasn't like a worker on the ship. He was just kind of like a friend to Captain Fitzroy for those two years. Um, and I won't go into the details, but uh, Captain Fitzroy um, kind of needs some, need somebody to go. The captains at the time need somebody to go along. And he went on uh, as a kind of just a, not specifically as a naturalist, but like a friend to the captain and became the naturalist uh, just over time. He went to a place that I actually went to, you're going to see a picture here, called the Galapagos Islands. It's about a couple hundred miles off the coast of Ecuador in South America. He was, again, traveling in South America, came around here, went to the Galapagos Islands and uh, discovered a lot of cool species there. So you can see here, it's at the verge of a lot of different tectonic plates and a lot of different ocean currents. And uh, it's a very... It's, this is a place with a lot of biodiversity, and every single island has a lot of different features, a lot of different vegetation, a lot of different precipitation, and just a different type of habitat. And you can see here, I went there a couple of years ago with some Belfon students. Um, we went on a trip to the Galapagos and Ecuador, and it was absolutely amazing. These are the Galapagos tortoises, which are humongous. They are just, just crazy big. And what he saw was differences within each island of these different tortoises. And he could actually, he actually talked to the uh the natives that lived on the islands and he they they could say by the shape of the shell they could tell which uh which one of these tortoises came from which island which is crazy just just that they could understand that and then the the, the finches he saw each island had a different type of finch or each location had a different type of finch and it was based on usually what their feeding method was you can see we have plants insects seeds cactus and other insects but their beaks were all different and that got darwin thinking why did these each uh, each of these uh, finches have a different beak type. Why didn't they all have the same beak type? And that's because obviously they have evolved through thousands and millions of years of evolution to speci or specify on one type of feeding technique. All right. So in, uh, I gotta go back up slides. There we go. So where do these adaptations come from or where did these differences come from? What Darwin started to observe was there was a competition for resources on these islands and just generally everywhere. Things like food, shelter, water, mates, land, things like that that you need to survive. This leads to competitions between the organisms of a species, which means some organisms are going to die off because they're not going to get enough resources and other ones are going to survive and reproduce more. Now, um, the adaptation that I talked about, these are inherited characteristics that improve an organism's ability to survive and reproduce in a particular environment. You can see each one of these vocab terms, the, the, not vocab terms, the, each one of these descriptions of the frog is an adaptation. It's nocturnal eyes, selective hearing, toe pads, permeable skin, camouflage. These all help this frog survive and reproduce more in their particular environment. Now, where do these differences in the populations come from? It comes from mutations um, that change an organism's phenotype. So some, some proteins are going to be made, you know, with this way, or sometimes you have this mutation that changes the protein structure, which will again, change how that, that, that bird looks. So this is where those adaptations or those differences are, are or where they come from in a population. All right. So we're coming to, to a point here. This is, this is what we were talking about. This is like the, one of the most important slides natural selection. This is the process by which individuals with beneficial characteristics survive and reproduce more than other individuals. This is a perfect example of that natural selection. You can see here we have a variety of different beetles. You can see the tan beetles blend in better. You can see the bird eating the green ones. Obviously, that's going to change the frequency of the tan to green beetles in that population. Thus, this is going through evolution by natural selection. Another term that I like to use when talking about this is called fitness. Now, when you think fitness, you might think how strong somebody might be, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about an, a, the, the ability of an organism to both survive and reproduce. You can see a lower fitness, less children, less survive, or uh, uh, less of that gene being essentially passed on. 
higher fitness, more reproduction, more reproduction. This is, this is just talking about lower, higher fitness. So Darwin saw all this on the Galapagos Islands, and a lot of people think that he just had this epiphany, like, oh, I understand evolution now. No. He started to develop his theory on the islands and started to do research for more than 20 years, gather more evidence, correspond with other scientists, and uh, he actually wrote his book over that time period. It wasn't like he wrote his book on the way home. Um, he took 20 years to gather more evidence. And there was another person he was caught corresponding with called Alfred Russell Wallace, who I like to show a little video about. But he went to the Amazon, he uh, uh, I'm sorry, he went to the Amazon rainforest and the Marleo archipelago and started to understand the same things that Darwin was understanding through his own research. He sent a manuscript, just like a short version of what he was thinking about to Darwin, which kind of pushed Darwin to publish his book first. Um, there is a little bit of controversy between uh, Darwin and Wallace, but even Wallace admits that it was Darwin's theory because he got the, the evidence and understood it before, way before he did. Um, but Darwin published on uh, eight, or November 24th, 1859. It's called the On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. And uh, th this just kind of detailed the his understanding of how evolution works. And it's a really good read. Very interesting, very almost poetic read. But uh, the theory of evolution at that point started, started to be um, accepted by the scientific community and is now, now, again, in every biology classroom ever because it's just how all of life evolved. So one thing I like to go over, a couple, or a couple of things I like to go over with this is the tree of life. Um, and this is, this is the understanding. This is actually what Darwin drew here. Said, I think, and he, draw, he drew this tree of life. Um, but basically, this is how every species is linked. And uh, we go over how all of life is linked and how all of life has a common ancestor. You can see common ancestor is the last ancestor that two or more organisms have uh, together. I need to change, move the slide around. In fact, why don't I just do that right now? You'll just watch me do it. There we go. Move that down. Perfect. Okay. So... These are just, again, the common ancestor for like um, us and trees. We don't have a very recent common ancestor because, again, trees and us don't look very much alike. But we do have a common ancestor that would, that would span back millions and billions of years ago. Um, we go over, we, we're going to talk about the tree of life and we're going to be looking at some trees here, some videos off the show and link. All right, so... Um, Artificial selection. I like to talk about artificial selection at this point. Sometimes I like talking about it earlier. But basically, this is, is the selective um, breeding of domesticated things like dogs, cats, uh, corn, vegetables, anything that we take and we kind of pick which offspring are going to reproduce further on because they are beneficial to us. Um, this is a pretty easy concept for, to understand because it's like humans doing it. Um, it's not in nature. That's the difference here between natural selection and artificial selection is humans do artificial selection. Natural selection is just natural. It just happens on its own. And you see modern dogs are from the wolf, or they have an ancestor of wolves. I think cats are next. Yep. Mm -hmm. Corn used to look like this, and we have naturally, or not actually, artificially selected it over thousands and thousands of generations. You can see all of these different vegetables are from a wild mustard plant that, that lived um, thousands of years ago. You can see the wild cows versus domesticated dairy cows. The chickens nowadays are much more, they're much beefier, much larger. There's a lot of videos here. Okay, I'm going to stop here with the evidence of evolution. Um, but in the next section, we're going to talk about the evidence to support evolution. And I give the, the term fame to remember. It's called fossils, anatomical, molecular, and embryological. All right, getting back to this. So our first one, it stands for F, is uh, fossils. These are the remain of once living organisms. You can see the like a death and decay, the rapid burial that you need, permanent or permineralization, and then the erosion to expose those fossils. And we have literally thousands and thousands of fossils. Um, within the fossil, I can see I have all these marked with F. We have a lot of superposition. This just states that older life is found deeper in the layers. Younger life is found closer to the top. So you can see like the Holocene is the closest. While like the Cambrian and the the Archaean, which are millions and billions of years old, are closer to the bottom, and that's just because as things die, they layer, and that's just called the law of superposition. All right, complexity of these fossils is going to increase as you get closer to the top. So what we see is in these fossils, as we go deeper down in life, their life life is not as complex as it is towards the top. We're not the like we are very complex today, but we're not like the most complex species that will ever live. Um, 
you know, in, in a billion years, what life looks like on Earth is going to be totally different and probably more more complex. Um, but we see this general increasing of complexity uh, as time goes on. All right, that's the that's all for the fossils. Now we're going to anatomical. Anatomical, we have a couple different types of structures. We have something called homologous structures. These are structures that are similar because they are inherited from a common ancestor. You can see how each one of these species has a has commonality between the humerus, radius, ulna, the metacarpals, and phalanges. They just evolve those bones differently throughout again millions of years of evolution, but they all inherited from an organism that lived millions and millions of years ago called Tiktaalik, who had a humerus radius on a metacarpal and phalanges that was very primitive. And we show a video here, you can see uh, the ancient lobe fin fish, that's Tiktaalik that we're talking about, but that species would evolve later into all of these different uh, species and they would evolve functions that are much different. So like if you put a turtle leg on an alligator or an alligator leg on a bird, it's not going to function correctly because it's specific to that species. Show a lot of good videos here. So if you're not in class, I'll try to link them. But if I don't, remind me. Analogous structures. These are structures that have the same function but evolved different uh, from a different common ancestor. So like you have the, the uh, I think this is the pterodactyl wing. Yes, yeah, is that fourth finger? Yeah. Uh, the pterodactyl wing, you have the bird wing, and then you actually have the bat wing, which all have the same function but didn't evolve from a common ancestor. They evolved independently of each other throughout the time. So it's showing that there is an evolutionary advantage to flying, but not all species will fly. Again, analogic, analogous structures. The leg here, same function, different common ancestor. The fin here, same function, different common ancestor. Wings here, same function, different common ancestor. Next, we have vestigial structures. These are structures that have no apparent function but are inherited from a past common ancestor. So like snakes who did have legs millions of years ago have hip bones. We have a tailbone. Even though we don't have tails, we still have a tailbone because our ancient primitive ancestors had tails. Things like, I think the whales next. Yeah, the whales also walked on land millions of years ago, and they have hip bones, very primitive hip bones, but they still have them, but they don't have any legs or hips. Doesn't make sense if they didn't evolve from land first. You can see what the ancient mammals or the ancient whales look like. Go over more vestigial videos. These are good videos. Molecular evidence. So molecular, this is how much DNA we have in common. So like you and I share about 99.9% .9 of our DNA. Um, every species shares some amount of DNA on Earth, and it varies due to how recent our, our last common ancestor is. So like between us and chimpanzees, we share like 99% of the same DNA. With us and like a tree, we still share like a lower percent. I think it's like 30 or 40. I forget. Um, but it's still a percent, but it's much lower because our recent common answer is not very recent. Uh, here's a, here it is. You, so let me go back. You can see how much we share between each species. Uh, it's like a fruit fly. You share 60% with a fruit fly, 50% with a banana, 80% with mice. As we get more cl or closer to our more recent common ancestor, we share more and more of that DNA. And uh, the last one here, which is embryological, we can see uh, embryological similarities between all of life. I like to cover up this portion and try to ask students if they can identify each one of these. Um, but it just basically shows that all of life, uh, very early on the womb, kind of looks very similar. You can't you can't really tell the difference between all these these um, embryos uh, in development. But at the end, you can see it because there are such major changes then afterwards. But you can see as they develop, they have a lot of similarities. All right, this is the end of the chapter. So uh, yeah, here we go.